Okay, everyone, just want to welcome you back to uh, Monday Night Bible Class. This is going to be Class 23 in our series on God's sovereignty and human freedom and responsibility. And uh, the way I'm forecasting this, I think what will happen is, well, today we're going to start Romans 11. We'll probably get halfway through. Next week, we'll probably finish. And then the following week will just be a a class where we uh, recap, summarize, synopsize everything that we we covered in the course. Because I'm sure you've forgotten the first things that we looked at. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? So that's kind of the plan. And then Easter Monday, we'll be done. Should there be a test? (laughs) I could forward you guys an exam if you like. I remember two of them. That's pretty close to Okay, guys, why don't we, uh, let's have a prayer. Let's commit uh, the class to God's care, and uh, let's see what he shows us in the Bible. Dear Holy God of Heaven, we're just so grateful we can be here today in uh, comfort and security And we can open the only book under heaven you've ever written. It's uh, disclosing your precious and beautiful heart on the matter. And uh, Lord, we want to understand better the things you gave your man Paul to write. And so, Lord, as we dive now into Romans, the 11th chapter, we pray that the Holy Spirit who authored the Bible would be pleased to open its contents to us and open our hearts to this inscripturated special revelation from God. May these things be so for our edification and learning, and also to the glory of God. May these things be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, friends, let's go to uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 11. This is uh, the third and final chapter in this, it's a little block of scripture we call Israelology 101. And after Paul gets done telling us about our our horrible sin problem and our sin nature problem in uh, Romans chapters 1 to 8, he then wants us to understand a little something about God's covenant nation Israel. And that's what we've been studying verse by verse, working our way through Romans chapter 9 and 10. And now we get into Romans 11. And there's lots of very interesting things to see here, far less controversy in this chapter than we saw in chapter 9. That's good news. <laughs> but let's uh, look, please, at Romans 11, verse 1. Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. This is about as clear as you could ask in the Bible Uh, concerning God's intentions for his special covenant people Israel. I know it's very popular amongst liberal Christianity to suggest that God is absolutely finished with that people group. They're gone forever. The church has replaced forever national ethnic Israel. Um, And that's getting very, very popular. But I don't think it's correct here. Paul just is uh, as clear as he could possibly be. God has not cast away his people And uh, then he draws attention to himself. He's exhibit A in his argument. He's an Israelite. (laughs) Uh, He is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Benjamin. He says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And that's interesting, too, because Benjamin is the youngest of Jacob's children, right? And Paul is the youngest of the apostles. Uh, Maybe not in age, but in calling. He's, He's the last guy to get called, right? And some people see a little hint of that when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, um, last of all, Jesus was seen alive of me. I saw him alive as of one born out of due time. He was called later than the rest of the the 12 apostles. And I see there's a little something there perhaps. But uh, Paul uh, says he's exhibit A. God is still calling Jews to believe in him to the saving of their souls. It, It is happening it was happening in Paul's day. It's happening in our own day. And, uh, but Paul's pedigree here, he has much more to say about it in his epistle to the Philippians. I'd just like to turn there to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Because this is important. Philippians chapter 3, we're thinking about God's sovereignty. We're thinking about human freedom and responsibility. We're thinking about how God has chosen to govern man. 
and with a special emphasis now in these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11, how God has chosen to govern his people group Israel. So in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, uh, Paul wants us to know that he, he has no confidence in his flesh, no confidence in his pedigree, that is not contributing anything to him being saved, uh, and he wants us to go through it here. So look at uh, Philippians 3, verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Uh, there, here you have it. This is a common theme in the thought of the Apostle Paul. This is faith versus works and the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. This keeps coming up in Paul's writings. Isn't that true? Paul wants us to know that it's salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that Christ is sufficient, and that you're complete in Him. Common themes, they keep coming up. And the Bible only needs to say something one time for it to be true, right? So you know that when God is multiplying references to something, He really wants you to get it. And, and it's sort of a wonder, isn't it, that we have so many aberrant versions of Christianity, so many culty groups that say they trace their religious ancestries back to Jesus himself. I think of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Christian scientists and all, that, all the rest of it. Uh, and yet, how can they miss such a clear doctrine as salvation by grace through faith? And yet that's man's propensity, is just to keep um, falling back on his own felt self-sufficiency and autonomy, this idea that he can somehow contribute to his salvation, that he can earn his salvation, be worthy of it. Impossible. And that's a, it's a very important theme in the Bible, so I thought I should mention it here. But if Saul Paul had no confidence in his flesh, in his physical ancestry, or in his conduct, or anything like that, uh, what hope would we have? <laughs> I think Paul's pedigree and his early history is so much more impressive than mine. And Paul says, it's worthless. It doesn't contribute anything to me uh, coming into a right standing with God. So that's, a, that's an important lesson there. So we go back to... Romans 11 and verse 2, please. Romans 11, 2. And Paul reinforces the point here concerning Israel. Romans 11, 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, that, that false Canaanite deity, Baal. And so uh, you have a reaffirmation here. God absolutely has not replaced Israel forever with the church. Israel is his special covenant nation that will persist, I think, even into the eternal state. Uh, uh, Revelation, the final book of the Bible, you have two solid chapters there talking about the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness forever, and you get a glimpse of the capital city of heaven, New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem has 12 foundations, and each foundation has the name of one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, and the city has 12 gates, never closed, because no threat. There'll never be a threat. So the gates stay open, but on the top of each of the gates is written one of the names of the 12 patriarchs, the sons of Jacob. So there's always going to be this distinction between Israel and the church. It will persist into eternity. And even nations will be identifiable. They're going to bring their glory into that city. I don't know what that all means in detail. All I know is uh, God has seen to it that even in eternity, we're not going to all collapse into some kind of amorphous monistic blob where nobody is dis distinguishable from anyone else. You'll still be you. You'll still be special. You'll still be unique. And so will Jesus Christ, and so will everyone, and so will the nations, and so will Israel. 
And there you'll have that blessed, perfect, at long last, perfect, uh, a perfect balance between unity and diversity. A perfect balance has always existed within the members of the Trinity, between them, and that will exist between members of redeemed humanity also. Israel and the church, they will always be distinct. But uh, so Paul here, he's talking about uh, believing Israelites. This is the doctrine of the remnant. This is a common theme, especially in, in Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy. Believing Israelites, I believe there he's talking about the Israel of God from Galatians 6.16. The Israel of God. These are uh, national ethnic Jews, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are believing in Christ for salvation. And, but they're part of the remnant, the remnant. See, you can think of uh, national ethnic Israel. You could just imagine drawing a circle. Here's national ethnic Israel, right? Well, inside that circle is a smaller circle, and that's the remnant. That's the group who believe to the saving of their souls. The others, depending on how aligned they are against Christ and his purposes, it's a bit shocking, but in John's gospel, Jesus targets the religious leaders who are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he says, you're sons of the devil. You do not, you may not count your ancestry back to Abraham. Because if you were sons of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. And so he says, you are of your, of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. And you're going to do the works of your father. And that's, that's kind of horrible, right? But you see, uh, John the Apostle, he talks the same way about Cain. Remember? The first child born to the first couple. A physical descendant of Adam and Eve. But John sees his, his ancestry as coming from Satan. He was of that wicked one, and he slew his brother Abel, a good shepherd, by the way, and the prophetic voice on the earth. And in a sense, Cain becomes a shadow and type of apostate Israel, who engineered the judicial murder of Jesus, good shepherd, and so on. And, um, and then, well, I could just go to town on that one. The typology there is amazing, but I think you get the picture here. But there's always been this remnant. And so Paul here in Romans 11, he takes us back to 1 Kings 19, when Elijah the prophet squared off against all these uh, prophets of Baal, the Canaanite deity, and, he, and you remember this one? It's a fantastic account. Uh, Elijah said, why are you people wavering and waffling between two opinions? If Jehovah is God, worship him. If Baal is God, you worship him. And we're going to figure out who's who right now. And he says, I challenge all you prophets to a contest. You remember how it went? You, you arrange your sacrificial offering on the altar. And then you call on your God. You go first. And the God that answers with fire, that's God. We worship him. And what happened? Those, those false prophets are dancing around, crying out, morning to night. They're chanting, O Baal, hear us. O Baal. Okay, so that's vain repetitions. Jesus said, don't do that. That's what the heathen do. Oh, yeah, there they are. And... and there's no response. So then what? They began to cut themselves. The blood was gushing out of them. Why? They're going to get sympathy from their reluctant God. How did that work out for them? No go. No go. Why not? Because, I love how Dr. Whitcomb phrases this. He says, would you like to know why Baal did not answer? Because he had a horrible problem. Namely, he didn't exist. <laughs> and, he, and Dr. Whitcomb goes on and he says, because um, non-existing, that's a real obstacle to getting something done. <laughs> and, but he draws the comparison, actually, and I, this stuck with me. He said, you know, we have institutions of higher learning. You have these uh, centers for scientific research getting enormous amounts of grant money from our governments to study evolution. Evolution, show us how you did it. Just like calling out to the fake Canaanite deity. And evolution is silent. They haven't got the faintest clue how life could have coalesced. Uh, you know, inanimate matter could have, could have coalesced by uh, natural process alone into the first living system. Impossible. And it's been 60 or 70 years of scientists in the laboratory trying to figure out how this could have happened under something that looks like plausible prebiotic conditions and nothing's coming forward. And this is a bit like alchemy. This is a bit like that, you remember in the medieval times, they're trying desperately to find a way to turn lead into gold. 
And lead and gold are really not that different, but it turned out to be impossible. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. And I, I'm just waiting for the day that mainstream science will give it up. Stop praying to evolution. It cannot help you. It's a fakey deity, isn't it? So I thought I'd throw that one in there. But Elijah said, after the contest, he said, I'm it. That's it. There's no one left. There's just me. I was by myself out there. And God said, in effect, relax, Elijah. There are 7,000 men like you. There's a remnant. There are believers. And so um, in Paul's time, there, were, there was a remnant. In our own day, there's a remnant. It's a doctrine that goes all the way through the Bible. And uh, in verse uh, 5, in verse 5 here of uh, Romans 11, Paul says, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, again, if, if you're looking at this through uh, a Reformed or Calvinistic lens, then you're going to see something like this. You're going to say, this is referring to the fact that by God's grace, he elected or chose who would be a saved, believing member of the remnant. From eternity past, he, he elected who would be part of that remnant. And I, of course, I reject that. I've been rejecting that thing, <laughs> that doctrine throughout the whole course. I think a better interpretation would be that elect people are considered elect when they're in Christ, when, they're, uh, when they've received Jesus for salvation and they're said to be in Christ because Christ himself is God's special elect servant. He is called a living stone chosen by God. And you remember, uh, you go back to Isaiah 42, 1, it tells you those things. And in 1 Peter chapter 2. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the First Peter 2 passage is ex just explicit on this. So I would just remind you to, or encourage you um, to consult the First Peter 2 uh, passages on that, okay? It would be like verses 2 through 10 in, in, in that stretch there. You'll see that very clearly. So um, on that interpretation, you are considered elect when you're in Christ because you've re received him on faith for salvation, but we have to remember Paul's thought here. Works could never get you there. That's the point. You could never be in Christ by earning your way there. You could never earn your way to become one of the elect in that sense. It is by grace alone through faith alone. And I think that the following verse sort of um, reinforces that interpretation. If you look at verse 6 now. Verse 6. And if by grace then it is no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Now, that, that is almost a word-for-word -word, uh, quotation of Paul himself from back in Romans chapter 4, where the topic very clearly is salvation by grace alone through faith alone. And so I think Paul is just sort of repeating himself there. I think that is the thought. It says in verse 7, we have a question. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What was Israel seeking? Do you remember? What were they searching for? Paul was kind of talking about it in Romans 9 and 10. They're looking for righteousness, but they're seeking to establish their own righteousness. They cannot believe that righteousness would be imputed to them because of the exercise of their faith. That is a doctrine they reject. That's a stumbling block to them. And yet there's no good reason for them to reject that, is there? Because you remember Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's never changed. Righteousness is still the, cur or, excuse me, faith is still the currency in which God deals. If you exercise faith towards God, he will impute to your account righteousness. And yet the Jews don't like it. Uh, the unbelieving Jews are seeking to establish their own righteousness. And I'll just go back and read from Romans 9, uh, 31. Romans 9, 31. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written... Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus Christ in his gospel, that is to be received on faith, 
for imputed righteousness and forgiveness and uh, all the saving benefits of, of what Jesus accomplished, absolutely rejected. They want to establish their own righteousness. Uh, it says in uh, Romans 10, 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. This is willful ignorance of God's righteousness. That's willful and deliberate. They don't have to be ignorant about this. We'll see that. And they have not submitted. That's a pride issue. This is a pride. Everyone, you know what? The backbone of pride needs to be broken in every one of us before we can come into a saving relationship with God. There is no way you can be a proud person and think that you're self-sufficient and autonomous and you don't need help. How are you going to believe God when he says you're a wretched sinner and, and you're not deserving of the least of his mercies, but he's extending an olive branch to you? You, you can't, the two things will not work, will they? You have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and then he will exalt you in due time. So I think that's really, really important. So the elect, we're told here, the elect have obtained it. They have received Jesus for salvation. They've, they're done with uh, seek, uh, seeking for a righteousness of their own. They're just going to submit now to the righteousness of God, and they'll get it. But it says the rest um, were hardened. Um, the elect have obtained it, but the rest were blinded. Excuse me, they were blinded in verse uh, 7. Look at verse 8 now. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And again, just to repeat some things that we covered in previous lessons, I don't believe that God is just sort of reaching down and controlling people like puppets and making them blind and causing them to become stupid or things like that. He's not creating stupid people on the spot. I think what we're hearing here is that people um, have been willful, they've been willfully closing their eyes to uh, religious realities that God has been sharing with them. And in fact, remember, I, I don't think we have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 28, right near the end of, of the book of Acts, Paul references Isaiah, and he says, this applies to you Jews who don't want to believe. And he says in the passage, their hearts have grown dull and their eyes they have closed. Now think about that. Their hearts have grown dull. That means they weren't to start with. And their eyes they have closed. That means they were open to start with. And that maps on perfectly to what Paul said in Romans 1, that God has revealed himself to everyone, but people suppress and deny the truth by means of unrighteousness. And that's, that'll be big trouble for them. Because when God confronts them, Paul says they're going to be without excuse. He uses that phrase, without excuse. In Greek, anapologia, no defense. You, no one can say, well, why didn't you give me more to go on? Why weren't you more clear? No one will talk like that, because God is sufficiently clear. He's sufficiently clear to these people, too. And, um, but they are, this is a willing a blindness, a willing ignorance with these people. And that's why they're in trouble with God, okay? Now, if we move ahead here to verse 9, we're going to get a quote from the Old Testament that's, uh, I think, very telling too. Verse 9, And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. This is a quote now from Psalm 69. And we went through this psalm in our Sunday morning services. And I, in all that I was teaching, I never mentioned the fact that Paul uses it here. I was saving it for our course, so don't, don't you feel lucky? <laughs> Shouldn't use the word lucky. Don't, don't you feel blessed about this? <laughs> another dimension to this. There's a whole other dimension here that we want to think about here. Paul is referencing, quoting, and actually amplifying and modifying a little bit the quote from uh, David's psalm there, Psalm 69. He says, um, let their table become a snare and a trap. Now, if you go back to the original psalm, in context, uh, David is saying he's enduring a time of great stress and enormous opposition. 
and he's really feeling persecuted. He's really feel, feeling like um, he's alone, and he's, uh, there's hardships. He's enduring incredible hardships. Now, I don't know where this, uh, I don't know where you place this in the life of David, because he endured a lot of hard stuff. But he says, they gave me gall for food and vinegar to drink. Now, I don't know if that was literally true or if David's being poetic there. But it, in context, what he's saying is, when I was in deep need, these enemies of mine sought to add to my afflictions. And it's as though I was hungry and thirsty, and they gave me something bitter to eat and something disgusting to drink. And of course, this was actually literally fulfilled by Jesus on the cross, as he hung on the cross. And that's very powerful to think about too. But um, that's why David says, so let their table become a snare and a trap to them. That's a just recompense. Their luxury, their perceived self-sufficiency, David says, let those things blind them. Let those things become a trap and a snare to them. Um, This is a just recompense to them. Yeah. The recompense, is that like their own punishment? Payback. Payback. Yeah. Okay. Let them get paid back. Yeah. That is a just punishment. So... Uh, I think in context here, what Paul is getting at is the Jews have the same attitude as the people that were opposing David. They feel that they are self-sufficient. They feel autonomous. um, And because they feel this way, they are blind to religious truth. They're blind to the truth of who Jesus is and what the gospel really, really means and their deep need of a savior. They're blind to that. Their own pride and self-sufficiency has done that. So... their their table has become a snare and a trap. Just like what David wanted for his enemies, it's happening now uh, to Paul's enemies. But verse 10 is very interesting. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. Now that's a modification from the psalm. The psalm says, uh, make their loins to shake continually. You say, what could possibly be the connection here? (coughs) Bowing your back over... And your loins shaking, (laughs) that doesn't sound to to be any sort of connection at all. But there actually is, if you think about it. I think the idea here is, um, if a person is, if you place a heavy, heavy pack on someone's back, uh, how about a bag of stones or something onto someone's back, and they were bent over by the weight, and then they had to walk with this, I'll bet you their loins will start shaking before too long. They're going to be quaking. I think that's the idea here. Um, And I think that this is to be taken in a religious context too. Because that's where Paul is in his thought. These people are loaded down. This is unbelieving Israel. They are absolutely positively loaded down with religious obligations that are doing nothing to contribute to their salvation. And Jesus talked like this to the Pharisees. Do you remember? Now, reading here from Matthew 23 and verse 4. And um, this is... This is Christ's words about those guys who are supposed to be the respected religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. He says they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one of them with their fingers. Do you see that? They're adding to the restrictions and requirements of the law and they're making it, making it absolutely impossible. In fact, Jesus said, you men will travel land and sea to make a proselyte. To your aberrant uh, apostate Judaism, and you make that convert twice a son of hell as yourself. Right? Is, and I think this is what's going on here. Now you compare that to Matthew eleven twenty eight. What did Jesus say? Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can shake that law off your shoulders and all the added things all the other restrictions, requirements, prohibitions, and name it all, shake it all off. You walk in freedom now. But, uh, e- but then in Paul's day, and even now, religious Israel is in bondage to the, to the letter of the law and all the other rabbinic uh, accretions to it. And Paul talked like that in Galatians 4. Remember that? He said it's very ironic, but um, Abraham had two sons, right? He had a son by uh, Sarah... She's a free woman, and she had a son of promise named Isaac. But he also had a son from the bondwoman, Hagar. Her son's name was Ishmael. 
And he says, religious Israel, apostate Judaistic Israel, you're the son of the bondwoman. That's you. Because you correspond, that, all, that whole thing there corresponds to Sinai. And the church now, the believing church, corresponds to the son of promise, Isaac. Now that would be offensive, I think, <laughs> to an observant Jew. But Paul is not going to pull any punches here on this. And that is why um, apostate Judaism centered in Jerusalem was called Egypt in Revelation 11, verse 8. Egypt was the place of bondage to the Israelites. And now, well, in Paul's time, it was Jerusalem, dominated by false religion, apostate Judaism with all its um, adherence to the Sinai law, and then again, all the other added restrictions. on. So Paul said, you people are in bondage to this, and you got to get free. So that's a bit of irony too, I think. But, um, okay, verse 11. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. That's amazing. That's very, very instructive and helpful. God is telling us through his man Paul, Israel didn't stumble, didn't wander into blindness and darkness and unbelief. God didn't see that 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 would happen just so that would happen. Just like for fun or something. (laughs) I mean, this we're getting down to the center of the center of the discussion here on God's sovereignty and human freedom and responsibility. We're really getting down to it now. God came into the world in the person of his son, Jesus. He presented himself to Israel. He fulfilled what was said of him in the Old Testament. They didn't have to miss him. They chose to miss him. Now, he contributed to that by concealing some of his teachings behind parables and coming from Galilee. And let's let's face it, he did conceal his identity a little bit. But they could have asked him. They could have drawn near. They didn't need to be in darkness. But God knew that if he presented himself this way, they would willingly and freely reject him. They didn't need to. It was a free thing that they did. He knew they would do it. And that led to the judicial murder of Jesus. And that led to Jesus accomplishing a stupendous redemptive work for the world. That's the wisdom, power, sovereignty of God. And that's human freedom and responsibility. That's how these things are coming together. And that's very mysterious. But it's far deeper than God controlling men like puppets. It's way deeper than that, I think. But he says, Israel fell the way she did to accomplish this redemptive work so that the Gentiles could get saved and that when the Gentiles got saved, Israel would look at them in right standing with God and in the freedom they were walking in and they would be jealous and want that. You see? And that's way more than God just zapping people and make them, making them believe. There's something about our experiences, what we see and observe in the world, that lead us to freely receive Jesus for salvation. And for the Jews, Paul is convinced that, uh, that a robust, sincere, godly, Gentile witness will reach those people. It will move them. Paul's convinced about this, you see? And that's amazing to me. Um, look, please, at verse 12. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now, think about that. If uh, their fall and failure ended up blessing the world through the redemptive work of Jesus, what is going to happen when Israel is a believing nation again and restored in a proper state and standing before God? What are they going to do for the world when they're like that? And here, I think we have a gentle reference to the millennium. And uh, there's lots of passages in the Old Testament, lots of passages that talk about it. But I just want to read from Isaiah chapter 2, because this is very beautiful. And we have a part to play in this. You're going to enjoy the kingdom too. But uh, Isaiah chapter 2. I'll just read a couple verses from the beginning of the chapter here. All right. Chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. 
And all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And there's passages that talk about people clinging to Jewish people, saying, teach us the law. And lead us to Jerusalem. Teach us the law. Help us to get right with God. And all kinds of passages like that, promising such things. I think Paul might be alluding to some of this here when he's asking us to consider how blessed the world will be when Israel's in a right state and standing with God. But um, I want us to look at verse 13 now because this, this is really going to speak to the issue of God's uh, sovereignty and human freedom and responsibility. Uh, Romans eleven thirteen. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. Think about that. At long last, Paul has finally come to terms with God's ministry call on his life. Uh, Paul shared with us in, in Romans chapter 9, the first couple of verses. Remember, he has tremendous love and affection, care and concern for his countrymen, the Jews. He wants to reach them with the gospel. That's priority one for Paul. I've got to preach the gospel to the Jews. Every place he went, synagogue first. He said, uh, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first. That's priority one for Paul. And in uh, Acts chapter 22, you remember what happened there? Uh, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, and uh, the angry Jews were about to pull him in pieces, and uh, the Roman soldiers had to come and rescue him. And they were bringing Paul up the stairs to lead him into the barracks when Paul asked the centurion, can I please address the people? And they had a little exchange with the Roman soldier, Finally, he said, okay, go ahead, Paul, you're allowed to speak. So Paul, from the stairs, addressed all these Jews, a little ocean of them underneath him, and he spoke in Hebrew to them. And he explained who he was, what he'd been doing, and, um, and he said that he was sent to the Gentiles. And he says, you know, when I was here in Jerusalem before, uh, the Lord told me, get out of here. And he says, um, he says, I replied, I said, Lord, they know that I persecuted your, your people. In other words, I think I can get through to them. I was more zealous to destroy the church than anyone. I think I can reach them. And the Lord Jesus said, no, they're not going to listen. Get out of here. You go to the Gentiles. And I think, that, uh, I think that Paul was a little bit sad by that. I think he wanted to reach his countrymen. I don't think, he was, I don't think the Gentiles were priority one for Paul. <laughs> a little bit like Jonah, but not quite as bad. But Paul, he understands something about the wisdom of God here too. And Paul meditated on this and he, he thought, wait a minute. If I'm called to the Gentiles, you know what I'll do? I'll win so many of these people, my countrymen will have to take notice. And I can save some of them. What an attitude. That's a wonderful attitude that guy has. You can learn something from, from Paul. I think I can learn something from him. And um, he's a bit like Abraham. You remember Abraham? Uh, God said, now Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only begotten son, the son of your love. You bring him up to the top of Mount Moriah and you offer him to me. It, that must have been very hard, right, to say the least, understatement of the century. But Abraham did it. He brought his son to the top of that mountain, pulled out the knife. But you know what the writer to the Hebrews says? He says, Abraham thought it through. He thought it through. He said, wait a minute. God made some promises concerning this boy. So God never lies. If I slay him, he'll raise him from the dead. That's what it says. He thought, he thought it through. Oh, this is how it's going. Oh, I see how it's going to work. And that's Paul. Oh, I see how this is going to work. I'm going to reach so many Gentiles. It'll, it's actually going to be a witness to my people. That's how I'll reach them. And that's, that's lovely. That's a lovely thought. And I like to share. I like to think about that. But um, how do you like irony? A little irony, it's good for the blood, I hear. <laughs> Israel was intended to be a witness to the nations. And Paul said, that's Deuteronomy 4, but Paul says, guess what? Save Gentiles, 
enjoying freedom and imputed righteousness will be a witness to unbelieving Israel. And they'll be called to believe. That's amazing. Now they're a witness to them. And so that is why Paul was laboring so faithfully. So in Colossians 1.28, uh, Paul says um, he is laboring tirelessly. He says, I am preaching the gospel to every man. I'm warning every man that I might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, of course, he's doing that because he loves people. There's no doubt. Paul says, I'm a debtor to uh, barbarians too, everyone. But let's face it, he's got a special love for his countrymen, and he is trying to win lots of Gentiles to be a witness to them. I think that's what's going on. Verse 14 says, he's trying to provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. And um, I'll just say I don't want to beat a dead horse, but that sounds a contra reform theology, contra Calvinism, where it sounds deeper than that. It sounds like, yes, the things that confront you in this life, your experiences, the the people you talk to, the things you learn, those all contribute to you making a free choice to receive Jesus for salvation. It's not just getting zapped and, and converted on the spot. There's more to it. I, I think there's much more to it. But, okay, verse 15, very quickly here. Verse 15. For if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Um, Absolutely unimagined. No one in the Old Testament could have ever imagined that by setting aside God's covenant nation um, through unbelief, mind you, that that could be used by God to bring salvation to the world. There is not a prophet in the Old Testament that forecasted that. That's a shock. That's a real shocker. That's why I say we must let God t disclose himself to us. We cannot... It's, it's wrong-headed to say, well, God is sovereign... And uh, I'm, going to I'm going to determine now what sovereign means, and therefore I will determine how God must exercise his sovereignty. We, we, will, we will come to wrong conclusions because God is so shocking. Jesus was shocking in how he conducted himself, right? So um, this was unimagined. Now he's talking about Israel's restoration to what? Forgiveness and imputed righteousness and a proper and blessed state and standing before God. And he, Paul calls this life from the dead. You people were dead, but as you come to faith in Jesus, it's life from the dead. And as, an ethnic, as a national ethnic group, they are going to experience that resurrection from the dead. The Bible insists on that. And um, this is very interesting to me because Christ's re own resurrection from the dead led to converted Gentiles. Isn't that true? Paul went to the, the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. He said, hey guys, do you remember what I first told you? I gave you, first of all, as a first importance, I gave you a message. It was that what? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He said, that's the first thing I gave you. It's the most important thing. And what? An ocean of Gentiles believed. And uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that factors... Uh, well, centrally and foundationally to all the speeches in the book of Acts. That's the apostolic witness. So Christ's resurrection from the dead leads to Gentile conversions. But guess what? Israel's resurrection from the dead will lead to Gentile conversions too. I believe in the tribulation period when Israel is reactivated through the ministry of the two witnesses and then the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, you'll have believing Gentiles converted. And Jesus said he's going to judge those people too. He'll gather the, the nations before him like a shepherd gathers flocks and you'll have sheep and goats. And um, it'll all hinge on how did you regard my covenant people Israel? What did you do to the least of these, my Jewish brethren? How did, how did you? Because it'll be so clear. If you align with Israel, you align with her God. It'll be very crystal clear in the tribulation period, I believe. But... Um, Israel's resurrection will be life to the Gentiles. A sizable number of Gentiles will be converted. In fact, uh, Zechariah 14 talks to us about the millennium. There'll be living Gentiles going into the millennium because they were faithful to Israel and her God. And there's going to be some uh, instructions for those people going into the millennium. Like, for instance, they will be obligated to go to the Feast of Tabernacles every year. Zechariah 14 insists on it. The nations that won't, well, your crops aren't going to do so good. <laughs> Go up there, send a delegation, at least send a representative body once a year to Israel 
to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. But that just shows that there will be a Gentile population going into the millennium, believers, when Jesus returns, okay? But I do want to cover this because this is very precious here in uh, Romans 11, verse 16. Verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. The first fruit. Okay, what's the first fruits? Well, if you go back to Leviticus 23, uh, you read about the Feast of First Fruits, and here we're talking about the barley harvest. And what would happen is uh, some representative of the priesthood, they're going to go out into the field, and you're going to see the barley. There it is blowing in the wind, and they chop some of it down. They take a sheaf out, and now they're holding this thing, and it's not blowing anymore. It's dead. And they're going to wave this before the Lord, a wave offering. Hey, guess what? It looks alive now. It's blowing again. And that's why Jesus is called the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus died and he was raised to life. And that, that waving of the sheaf symbolizes uh, resurrection. And then he says, if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And uh, if the root is holy, so are the branches. The lump here, I believe this is referring to Numbers chapter 15. So what was happening here? The first of each batch of cakes that was made uh, would be offered to the Lord, not as a wave offering, not back and forth like this, but a heave offering up and down. And remember, the context here is resurrection. Uh, Israel's reactivation will be a resurrection from the dead, Paul says. And you see that in the wave offering and in the heave offering. A resurrection and what? An ascension and a descending from heaven and back. Jesus was raised to life and ascended to heaven. He will return. You see that, you see that symbolized? I believe you see that symbolized in the heave offering. We will be raptured to return with Jesus. By the way, between the wave offering and the heave offering, don't you see the cross? Very interesting. The Bible's so deep, we'll never get to the bottom of this book. <laughs> but let's try. <laughs> but uh, when Paul's talking about uh, first fruits and he's talking about the lump and the dough, uh, we can't help but think about ourselves here too. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, hey you guys, you've got to purge out the, the sin from among you. Purge out the leaven. He calls it leaven. And be a, he says, you guys are a pure lump. Spiritually, you're pure. Hey, let's start looking like it. Purge out that old leaven of malice and envy and hateful, objectionable attitudes and conduct. Get that out of here. Because he says, Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us. And now you're a new lump, right? Uh, Jesus is the bread of life, and you're his body and bride. So that's something to think about. Make our outward conduct and appearance match our, the inward spiritual reality here. Uh, make outward conduct match what's happening in our born-again heart. But if you come back to Romans eleven sixteen, I think what Paul's getting at here, when he talks about the first fruit, and he's talking about the root, I believe what he's talking about there are the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those, those uh, progenitors of national ethnic Israel. They are the first fruit and the root. And I think most Bible commentaries are going to see it that way also. The ones I consulted all saw it like that. I saw it like that. And um, the branches here would be the physical offspring of those guys. So the root and the first fruit are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And um, the progenitors, the federal heads, the representatives of national ethnic Israel. And God made promises to those guys. Later on, he's going to say, Israelites are beloved uh, for the sake of the patriarchs. He actually will say that in verse 28. Concerning the gospel, unbelieving Israel are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. The first fruits and the root, the fathers, the patriarchs. Those guys that God made unconditional promises to. Okay? And so he says, uh, the branches are holy and the lump is, is holy. And I wanted to explore that a little bit in Romans uh, eleven seventeen. 17. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, 
and with them became partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. That olive tree he's talking about there, some theologians refer to that as the, um, the Abrahamic tree of blessing. And we are grafted into that tree by faith. Some branches are broken off through unbelief. And, uh, but he says, you are partakers of the root and the fatness of that tree. And this is the, the spiritual blessings like imputed righteousness and the forgiveness of sins, coming to a proper uh, state and standing before God. Those, those would be the spiritual blessings of being grafted into that tree. In fact, the indwelling Holy Spirit is mentioned as being one of these Abrahamic blessings. And so I'm going to read this from Galatians 3, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I mean, what a contrast. You have an Abrahamic tree of blessing, and you have a ghastly tree of cursing. And Jesus hung on that tree so that we could be grafted into the tree of blessing and receive of its fatness and, and bear fruit uh, for Christ's name and honor. He says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So there are spiritual uh, blessings, privileges, and responsibilities for being uh, part of that tree, that Abrahamic tree of blessing. And, uh, but Paul says, don't boast against the, the other branches that were broken off. And that's a sad commentary, you know. I, I, there are some things, I, I like Martin Luther. He wrote some pretty good stuff. I have writings of Martin Luther in my library. I don't agree with everything Luther said. I think he's more Calvinist than Calvin sometimes. But he has lots of good things to say. But later Luther is very anti-Semitic. He's very hateful to the Jews. Like he goes off the deep end. And that's sad. He's boasting against the branches, I think, a bit there. And Paul said, you shouldn't do that. Because um, later on, not today, we're going to run out of time, but Paul's going to tell us that having a proper understanding of Israel and God's plans and purpose for Israel will keep you humble. And that's why it's, it's kind of sad you see kind of arrogant, prideful, boastful Christians. Normally I see that attitude amongst the replacement theologians. Normally. And, uh, well, the two things sort of go hand in glove, I think. Lots of exceptions, I'm sure, but the, I've observed that. But uh, historically, a good deal of anti-Semitism in the professing Christian church, and that is against Paul's express command. So... It's kind of important that we regard national ethnic Israel properly, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read another passage here, and then I'm gonna leave it for you guys to think about in the coming week, okay? And then we'll come back, and we're gonna ask some difficult questions, and I'll just telegraph it. Can a person lose their salvation? Can you forfeit your salvation? That's what we're gonna think about. Let's read it. Romans 11, verse 19. Here we go. You will say, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now, I'll just let, I'll let that hang. <laughs> I think that sounds serious. How are we going to understand that? that? That'll be our homework. This coming week, read that, think it through, compare verses with other verses, and next week when we come back, we'll pick it up right there. We'll probably finish the chapter. But that, that's an important thing to think about. Are there any thoughts, questions, or comments... Give the, lump is. the in the context here, yeah. uh, I believe he's referring back to I think it's Numbers 15. Was that my reference? I thought it was. Uh, yes, Numbers 15, 18 to 21, and there I think he's talking about the dough that was used to make the cakes, and the first of each batch of cakes was to be offered as a heave offering to God. Yeah. 
Yeah, but what does it mean spiritually? I'm not sure. Well, he's got national ethnic Israel as the lump. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah. But he says the first, the first fruits are, I believe, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. The first of the lump. Any other thoughts, questions? Or Paul is not always easy. Peter said so. I think I believe you, Peter. Yeah. It's kind of like Mormons next Tuesday or Monday. But if we could lose our salvation, wouldn't we lose it immediately? Because we're looking this. That's a good question. <laughs> think it through. We'll have a good discussion next week. Okay, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll close us off with prayer. And you're certainly welcome to uh, stay and visit and enjoy each other's company. Our dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, we're so grateful that we could be here today. And Lord, you really took us deep today, considered many, uh, many things, delicate, precious things in the Bible. And we know we're only barely scratching the very outer edge of your precious, infallible, inscripturated revelation. But thank you, Lord, for revealing what you did today. We pray that we will have a good week and that we will be honoring to you and the things we do, and that we'll be a blessing to others. And in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise God. Okay, God bless you, everyone, and thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you.